Good afternoon, David Singer Enterprises and Gupta Enterprise clients. This is a repeat performance, encore presentation of how to deliver a report of findings uh, to a patient uh, regarding their treatment program and filling out, demonstrating, and using the patient progress graph. Very excited to be here. Uh, I apologize for last week. We, uh, I probably laid down the best webinar to date, but unfortunately, uh, I double clicked a button and recorded only two seconds of it, as opposed to the entire full 59 minutes, which it lasted last week. So this is a repeat performance. We have a lot of docs who can't make the live webinar, but then listen to the recorded version thereof. So we are re-recording it. And hopefully it can uh, it can duplicate what we did last week because it was very very helpful. So here we go. So let me paint the picture for you. Um, this is a patient who has come in for now what we call a day two. It's a report of findings. Um, and uh, so we have spoken about the day zero. The day zero is the console. And that's where you take the history of the patient, you find out what makes, makes things better or worse, you uh, address the chief complaint, any other uh, complaints that they may have, um, and you make it, you tell them that as a result of the consult, you make the decision as to whether or not you think they would be a good candidate for an exam to definitively find out whether or not you can help them. The exam is day one. Uh, so you perform the day one exam, and then you send them home. You tell them, we don't accept all patients for care. We only accept those patients that we know we can help. And I don't know if we can help you uh, until I assess the results from this exam. I will bring you back in. And on that day, when I walk into the room, immediately I am going to tell you yes or no. Either yay, I can accept you for care, or no, I'm going to refer you to somebody who I think can help you. So that is the day one. The day two is what we're about to begin. Now the finances, which is the second part of the day two, I've done in another webinar, uh, and you're able to watch that, where I close a patient who is a cash patient, an HMO patient, and an out-of-network patient, and I give you different examples of how about uh, to go about closing each one. This part, which is the first part of the day two, is to do the report of findings, explain to the patient what you found, what that means, whether or not you can accept them, and if so, what their treatment program uh, is that you're recommended, recommending for their care. So let's go ahead and pretend that we are beginning the day two. So the patient would already be sitting in the consultation new patient room or report of finding rooms uh, if it's a different room for you in your office. And as the doctor, I'm approaching that room and knocking on the door. Come in. Hi, Mary. How are you? So good to see you again. Hey, Dr. Raj, how you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? How'd you make out on that first visit? I, You know, when I called you, you had told me that you were a little sore, and I had recommended you put some ice on that. Uh, we Did you do that? You know what, Doc? I was a little sore, but no, I didn't put the ice on it, and I was okay the next morning. Oh, okay, great to hear. She, But I do note that I felt a little better in the morning, as if some correction had been made. Uh, I just had more mobility. Excellent. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. So, Mary, I've got good news. Uh, I, can, I can accept you for care in our office. Now, as I told you yesterday or the day before when I had seen you, that I don't accept all patients for care. I only accept those patients that I know I can help, and I'm very happy to say that I can accept you. So Mary, if you're like any one of my patients that I've seen over the last 20 years, you probably have two questions for me. How long is it gonna take, Dr. Raj, and how much is it gonna cost me? <laughs> yeah, Doc, I do, thanks so much, I appreciate it. Um, okay, Mary, well, I'd like to address both of those right now, if that's okay. Great, Doc. If it's all right with you, I'd like to start with how long it's going to take. But before I get there, let me go ahead and show you what I found on your exam. So, Doc, I would take out this form. This, this form here in front of you is 
our exam grid. So what we test when we do an examination of patients is we test, uh, we do orthopedic exams, both upper and lower. We test for muscle weakness and, and strength, both upper and lower. We do range of motion, both upper and lower. We do trigger points, so we look for uh, um, localized and tilled muscle spasms, which are trigger points uh, that might be causing pain in the upper and the lower. And then on the bottom here, I just write x-ray results because uh, we take x-rays in our office and we include this on the sheet as a positive finding. Should we find anything? So, um, for instance, we would write down here, um, let's say I found four. Now, one thing I want to address is you may have a patient that comes in with solely neck headaches and upper back pain. Um, I would encourage you to dig uh, as much as you can to find out if they have lower complaints as well, because oftentimes you will address the patient's upper back and neck pain, uh, which were the, their complaints, and then they'll say, you know what, doc, I forgot to tell you, I got some low back pain too. So I would I would suggest digging in the beginnings to, to save yourself work. Um, also, more than likely they do have lower back pain. Now again, we're medically necessary. Don't make make don't make stuff up. Uh, but I do prefer to treat the entire spine as opposed to just an area of the spine, considering you have four curves, but it all is just one spine. I, I believe that adjusting the, the cervical spine, thoracic spine, is going to affect the lumbar and pelvis. Uh, so as a result, I, I like my own clinical um, um, preference is to do upper and lower. So I suggest uh, and that you do a little digging and see if you can find uh, either upper if they have lower complaints or lower if they have upper complaints and see if they have anything that exists. So then you're going to write down all the positive findings that you find. Now, are you only writing positive findings on this grid? No. Docs, you want to, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. So, for instance, if the patient is coming in and presenting with um, pain when sneezing or coughing, you suspect a disc. So you want to make sure that you do a couple of disc orthopedic tests which I'm sure you do. So let's say you do a Valsalva and the Valsalva is negative. Um, make sure you write that down. Don't count that when you're adding up all the positive findings as a positive finding, um, but write down Valsalva negative. Um, so to show that you did your due diligence, um, you don't just want to write down the positives on this form. However, you want to add up the number of positives and write that in the margin. So I would write, for instance, over here, orthopedic test. I'd, add, I'd show them upper and lower uh, and say that added and that was eight. So I'm going to write that down. Ortho, eight. Uh, and that's upper and lower combined. Muscle strength. Um, so let's say that you found that there were two muscles that were weak. And then for trigger points. You write down how many trigger points you found between the upper and lower. Say we found 14 there. Uh, range of motion. Say we found four ranges of motion that were uh, restricted or, gave, or, or, or were painful. And then x-rays, I would say, let's say we found eight. So um, I write that all in the left-hand margin. And then I'd review with the patient. Okay, Mary, so this is what we found. So do you remember, Mary? When we were, I had you bend over at the waist to the left, and that gave you some pain. Well, um, that's a positive finding. Mary, when I had you bend to the right, and it didn't give you pain, but we both agreed that you could not bend over at the waist as much as we, we both would have liked, that's a restricted range of motion. That's also a positive finding. So you, that counts as one. So here's a caveat to this form that I was just speaking about with a colleague this morning. Say, for instance, for trigger points and range of motion. For trigger points, uh, if it's uh, you, mild, moderate, or severe, you may want to categorize and add different weight value to each level. So if it's mild, maybe it counts as one point. If it's moderate, maybe it counts as two. And if it's severe, maybe it counts as three. This way, when you reevaluate the patient, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and you go back to test these areas. If it's reduced from severe to mild, maybe it's two points less, but it still counts as one because it's still a problem. If you don't allow yourself wiggle room, a patient 
who comes in and presents with severe muscle spasm, and you only count it as one, when it becomes mild and is still present, you can't show any improvement there where, in fact, there has been improvement. So uh, same with range of motion. Range of motion restricted. Range of motion restricted with pain is a two. Range of motion restricted just a one. So you add up all your points. You write it here in the left-hand margin. You review it with Mary. Not every test, but a bunch so you can get her head nodding. And she realized, oh, I remember doing that. Yep, I remember that. I remember that. So that you add it up. So we wrote it down. So that's 16. That's 22. Um, that's 36. So that's 36 positive findings that we, we found. Okay, Mary? Okay. So Mary, what I did is I transferred these findings onto this graph here. And right here on the back, you'd write, like, so... I, I cross out palpation, I put trigger points, or TP, range of motion, orthopedic tests, x-ray findings, and ortho. And I write next to them the number of tests that we found. And then down here, that number would be 36. Let me test my math. 8 plus 2 plus 14 plus 4 plus 8. Yep, it's 36. Okay. So you divide 100 by 36, and it comes up with 2.78. 2.78 is how much each test is worth. Now, I'm just talking to you doctors, not to Mary. So right now, I show Mary. Okay, Mary, so just like from the other form I had showed you, I transferred what I, what I wrote in this margin over here, and I put it onto this graph here on the back, where I wrote it here and just added it up, Mary. That comes to 36 tests, okay? So, Mary, what I did is I divided 100 by 36. tells me each test is worth 2.7 points. She's like, okay, um, what does that really mean, Dr. Raj? Well, let me show you what it means. Here we are, Mary. I flip over the chart. Mary's name is written here. The date of her initial exam is already pre, is in here. I had ri I've written it already. And the zero dot is in there. So, I'm like, Mary, here we are. This is the date of your exam. We're at zero percent improvement. We haven't done anything with you yet. So Mary, after 12 visits, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reevaluate, but I'm only going to reevaluate these tests, these 36 tests. So let's say, Mary, the next time that um, I reevaluate you, you only have 24 tests that come up positive, Mary. So you have 24 tests. Well, 24, uh, 36 minus 24. 36 is the number of initial, initial tests, original tests that you have positive. Now you only have 24. So 24 subtracted from 36 is 12. That's, you, you have 12 fewer tests positive. Then I take the 12. And I times that, Mary, by 2.78, which is how much each test is worth. And it shows me that you have made 33.3% improvement and up the graph you go. And Mary, our goal for you and all of our patients by the time of your first reevaluation is 25% improvement. And you write 25 in here. You could, or you can also have a pre-written in here. So Mary, in this example, you would have shattered our initial goal is 25% improvement. And at that point, we would reduce you in treatment program. So how long and how much? What, what is the frequency of treatment? So this is your first question, and this is what I'm, I'm about to answer, Mary. So we go by this graph to make sure that you are making improvement, and if you make your goal, we're going to reduce you in treatment program. Treatment program is three times a week. Oh my gosh, three times a week, Dr. Ross? That's a lot. I don't know if I can do that. Mary, I totally understand um, I, I, your, your, your concern. Um, but three times a week, this is like starting a gym program. So if you go to the gym and you decide that you want to increase your biceps by one inch in diameter, and you go to the gym once a week to work on your biceps, how long will it take for you to get your results? Oh, wow. Long time, Dr. Raj. Well, Mary, what if you go two times a week and you work only your biceps and you want to see an increase in one inch diameter? And Mary, you know, I get it. You're, you're 
just go play along with me, Mary. You may not want your biceps in one, growing one inch in diameter, but just play along with me for a second. Well, if I go twice a week, Dr. Raj, I guess I start to see some results. Sure. Okay, Mary, if you go three times a week, well, Dr. Raj, I guess I'd start to see results quicker. Yes, that's exactly, exactly right. One time a week is slow. Two times a week is medium. Three times a week is fast. Now, here's the thing. I won't even accept a patient at one time a week. And I'll tell you why, Mary. At one time a week, improvement is going to be so slow that you're going to discharge yourself and become non-compliant because you are not seeing results. And then believe that our care is not, is not helpful for you. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I won't even accept someone there because it's that they won't get the results that they're looking for. Two times a week, I'll accept you. Um, I will tell you this. All, most of my patients that come in at three times a week, for, and I'm only asking that for 12 visits, they always shatter that 25% goal. Those that only come in two times a week have about a 60 to 70% chance of making their goal. And the, the reason is, is the three times a week is going to have that much more effect. And frankly, this has been going on for a while, so I want to see you three times a week. And it's only for 12 visits. And I promise you it'll go quickly. And I do not typically have, have problems with patients adhering to this if it's that for that short a period of time. So we can talk about that in a second. So if you're able to make that 25% improvement, Mary, at that time I reduce you to two times a week. And then in eight to 10 visits, I'm going to reevaluate those 36 tests again. So let's say the next time you have only 12 tests that come out positive and you make, I don't know, 45, 50% improvement. And that's typically around where our second goal is. We will reduce you further from two times a week down to one time a week. Mary, our ultimate goal is to get you between 85 and 100% improvement. Unfortunately, we can't get all of our patients to 100% improvement because they've waited too long to take care of this problem and it's beyond correctable. However, um, we are a able to get many people to 85% improvement. Now, if we see that for whatever reason, you have plateaued and you do not seem to be making improvements any longer, then we do one of two things. We either change up our treatment protocol so that we can continue to make gains, or we, re or we discharge you for having reached max maximal medical improvement. And that means that you return as needed. And that's what we will do if you reach 85% improvement. Return is needed. And what that means, Mary, you know, right now you're so used to being in pain, you don't know anything else. But once we get you out of pain and you see what life is like without the, tip, the, the, the daily subjective complaints that you currently have, you will become very in tune with your body so that if you have a weekend warrior syndrome where you just do some gardening or play tennis or do something out of the ordinary that initiates pain, you will be in so in tune with being out, in, so feeling right that when you're not, you'll be like, I got to go see Dr. Raj. So that's up to you. That's your decision. Uh, but we have many patients that stay on um, and come in at, on an as-needed basis. But again, that's up to you once we discharge you. Um, but our ultimate goal is 85% improvement. So Mary, uh, do you understand... Uh, the how long now? Yes, Doc, I, I think I do understand. Okay, um, great. So there's another thing that I want to I wanna show you, if you don't mind, please, um, as well. And this is uh, to explain to you what it is we're actually doing for you. Okay, Doc, great. So I take out a piece of paper, and I'd like for all of you to do that, Doc, as well, and follow along here. Hold on a second. Let's see. Oh, yes. So, uh, you know what, Docs? I also review the x-rays with the patient. So before, I typically review that patient grid and add up the, the, the positive findings because at the bottom, I write the x-ray findings. I first start with reviewing the x-rays. So I say to the patient, okay, Mary, yes, I can accept you for care. Now you probably have two questions, how long and how much. And Mary, I, I want to start with how long first, if that's okay. But before I do that, 
let me show you everything that we found on your exam. So at that point, I start with x-rays. So I apologize. I started with the grid. But typically, I start with the x-rays, and then I show them the grid that I wrote the x-rays at the bottom, and then I review everything else, the orthopedic test, the range of motion. So when I'm done at this point, what I just caught up to and said, Mary, you now understand how long and how frequent. And she says, yes, I take out this, 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 uh, this merit chart. And I say, Mary, so this merit chart, you know, let me explain to you how your body works. Your brain controls everything that you do, and the rest of your body is a puppet controlled by your brain. But there is, there is this intricate phone system that has wires. It's called a spinal cord. And there's wires that come off these spinal cord that go to different areas, and they're responsible for your brain communicating with different areas of your body. So, for instance, the nerves in your neck, they go into your head, uh, your shoulders, your arms, your hands, and your fingers. And then the nerves of your lower back, they go into your legs, your feet, and into your toes. And the nerves in the middle back, which are so often overlooked, go to all the different areas of your body. So um, say, for instance, Mary, you just ate lunch, and you don't sit there and tell your stomach to digest food. It happens automatically. This is your autonomic nervous system. And it happens without you knowing subconsciously. So what happens is there's a message that goes from your brain. I'm sorry, from your stomach to your brain that says, hey, stomach, hey brain, I'm full. Brain's like, okay, stomach, no problem. I'm going to send digestive enzymes from the pancreas to you and you're going to digest the food. So the digestive enzymes go through the spinal cord, that big telephone wire through the nerves of T6 to your stomach, and then you digest the food. So here's the problem, Mary. So what I do here, Doc, is I interlock my fingers, uh, kind of like, you know, here's, here's the people, here's the church, and here are the people inside. I forget that, the old nursery rhyme. But you interlock your fingers so you show your, fi your, your fingers on the inside, and then you have holes on either side. So I say, Mary, Imagine this is your spine, and I wiggle my fingers. And these holes here on either side are the nerves that come out at every level of your spine like they do here, Mary. Go ahead and put your finger in one of those holes. So Mary puts her finger in one of those holes, and I immediately clamp on it and turn. I'm like, okay, Mary, so let's say your fist is your stomach. And the scenario that I just talked about with you eating lunch takes place, and the stomach tries to send a message to the brain. And you know what? It gets caught in the traffic jam, Mary. And, and the brain's like, what? What? It's like a being on a bad cell phone. So now you have a bad cell phone connection because that nerve, and I pinch harder on her finger, is choked or pinched. And it's not speaking properly, or it is speaking properly, but the messages can't get through. It's a bad cell phone connection, Mary. You're dropping calls. You're dropping lines. So your brain's like, listen, stomach, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. I hear you calling me. But I assume it's lunchtime and you just ate because this is the time you typically eat lunch. I'm going to send these nerves down to you. So Mary, the brain sends, talks to the pancreas. The pancreas sends the appropriate digestive enzymes. But then they get caught in this traffic jam and I squeeze on her finger again. I'm like, so Mary, you might have some problems. She's like, yeah. I'm like, so what kind of problems are you going to have? She goes, I'm not going to digest my lunch. I'm like, yes, Mary. Short term. You're going to have difficulty digesting your lunch. Long term, if this exists for a long period of time, you're going to have difficulty with the stomach. You're going to develop problems with the stomach. And those problems are like GERD, reflux, indigestion, ulcers, Mary, ulcers, all because your brain is not communicating to your stomach at 100% efficiency because you've got a bad cell phone line. So, Mary, let's go back to this chart. What I did, now this would be highlighted. Mary's name would be on top, written out already, the date of the initial exam written here. And I would have highlighted the areas already that I had found a problem with on her x-rays. So, Mary, the reason why I bring up uh, um, stomach pain or problems with the stomach is because you had initially told me on the consult that 
you sometimes have some indigestion, and we weren't sure if it was your diet, and it may be. We agreed it might be, and we're going to get you into a nutrition consult. But more importantly, listen, I found on x-ray, this is highlighted. Your T6 is misaligned. You have a choke nerve. You have a bad, bad cell phone line here. So look, you might, you, I, I, I check it off. You got, you do. You told me you've got indigestion and heartburn a lot, often, frequently. Interesting, huh, Mary? And your lower back, I know that's not your chief complaint, but you had mentioned that uh, you sometimes have some difficulty uh, um, you know, with your menstruation cycle. So uh, I don't know which one that is. I just made that up. So here we are. So your L3 was misaligned. We saw that on X. I just showed it to you. Oh, my God, Dr. Raj, that's so cool. Yeah, and now your chief complaint in your neck, um, you know, you told me you're getting a lot of headaches. And guess what? Your C1 was that very badly missing arm, which I just showed you. So anyway, Mary, I'm going to give this to you to take home. Um, it's very cool. And I want you to go through it and find out and listen. If, if for instance, you mark off uh, three things here, and maybe I'm going to go back and take another closer look at the x-ray. Maybe there's something else that I had missed. Uh, I don't think so. Um, but, but anyway, I want you to look at this and see if you can draw any more correlation because this is how your body works. Oh, wow. That's really cool, Dr. Raj. Okay, so then I flip this over. Mary, another thing I want to show you. Now, Doc, this is something I would like for you to do and follow along. Um, take out a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper, and this is what, and follow along as I describe this to Mary. And this is simply on the back of this merit chart, which eventually I'm going to give to her to bring home. Okay, Mary, so I, I draw a circle in the middle of the top portion of the page. I'm like, Mary, this is your brain. Your brain controls everything in your body, and I draw four, I draw five vertical lines from the middle bottom portion of that uh, circle, and I wrote, your brain speaks to the rest of your body through this telephone line, and then I connect those lines with another circle below the brain. Mary, if there's no interference on that phone line, and you could hear a pin drop like the old commercial on TV, then your brain communicates to your body, and you have, and I write inside the circle, 100% function. And then, Mary, I draw a line from the circle in the middle bottom portion of the 100% function circle down. I write, a, I draw a line and draw another circle. If that's the case, Mary, and you have 100% function, and in the middle of this new circle, I write the word ease. Then, Mary, you are at ease. But Mary, you are not at ease. You are not at ease because of all the complaints and, uh, and ailments that you're currently suffering with that we have spoken about. And frankly, Mary, you would not be sitting in front of me if you were at ease. And the reason why you're not at ease is I write that I, I, brought, I draw an X and lines horizontally, tangentially through the vertical lines from brain to a hundred percent function circle. And next to it. I write because you have something called a subluxation. Now, a subluxation is a fancy word for pinched nerves or choked nerves or bad cell phone connections. And as a result of that, where those nerves are going and trying to communicate with, you no longer have a 100% function. And I draw a line through the 100%. To the left of the circle, I write, you now start to have, Mary, something called malfunction. You're not functioning at 100% because you, you don't even get all the messages prop, proper. You have, a, you have an interruption of your, your cell service. You're not getting all your messages, and as a result, you start to malfunction. As a result of that, Mary, I go down to the next circle. You're not at ease. You have something called, and then to the left of that circle, the E circle, I write the word dis. You have dis-ease. Mary, the, that word means disease. And frankly, that's where that word comes from. It's, it's the sense of not having ease. It's disease. So, Mary, giving the previous example of your stomach and trying to digest lunch, what kind of diseases did we say that you might have as a result of a bad cell phone line to the stomach? And she says, reflux, gurg, she just regurgitates quite literally what I just told her. 
ulcers, right? But listen, there are nerves that go to your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your lungs. I just gave you your stomach as an example. Now, it's easy to see when you have a pinched nerve in the neck or the lower back. A lot of times, that causes pain or numbness and tingling, like sciatic nerve pain we all heard of. But I'm going to tell you, of all the millions of nerves that you have in your body, 90% are responsible for sensation, for function. Not sensation. Function, only 10% for sensation and pain. So you may not have pain and just lose function of, say, your stomach and not even realize that you have a nerve or an interrupted communication from your brain to an area. So then you have disease. So, Mary, you have a subluxation, then you develop malfunction, then you get disease. Then and only then do you get the last thing that comes in all problems. So, Mary, you don't cough and sneeze and then get a cold. 85% of people that have heart disease, the first symptom that they get is, is, is a heart attack. And that can be fatal. Symptoms, and then I write it in. I draw a line from the bottom and middle of the E circle. I draw another circle. And in that circle, I write symptoms. Mary, symptoms are the last thing to come in every problem in your life. The common cold, heart disease, cancer. Cancer is painless, Mary. By the time pain from cancer starts to present itself, it's probably stage three or stage four. Pain comes last. Again, you don't cough and sneeze and then get a cold. The symptoms come last. Now, Mary, as we start working with you, and starting to get you better, the, fir the first thing to go away is the last thing to come. And doctors, I write, I draw an X through the symptoms. So Mary, if your symptoms go away, and then I circle the dis next to ease, the mal next to uh, function, and the subluxation. So if your symptoms go away, Mary, and so do you, but you still have this, and I point to disease. And you still have this, and I point to malfunction. And you still have this, and I point to subluxation. Then Mary, I draw a line from subluxation back to symptoms, all the way down the chart. And I say, Mary, it's just a matter of time before your pain comes back. There are two types of care. So the bottom right-hand portion of the page now, I write two things. I write the word relief. Draw a straight line next to it, and on the other side of it, I write correction. Now, Mary, relief care is like a, a patch job. Quite literally, it's like filling a pothole. I'm sure you have potholes in, in your town or in your neighborhood that they continue to fill up, that continually open up again. Because the only way really to correct a pothole is to repave the road. Mary, there's a pothole, and I'll talk about a local road by my office that I know that they've probably traveled recently if they're a local. And I'll say, Route 18 is riddled with potholes. Mary, on my way home on Route 18, I would follow a string of cars in the left-hand lane that would all shift over to the right-hand lane and back to the left-hand lane together because we all knew where the pothole was. And they would fill this up. They would fill this up. They would fill this up. And you know what? One day I had the mayor of the town and I asked him about it. And he, and I told the mayor, if you had just repaved the road initially, it probably would have saved the town some money. So sure, sure enough, he ended up, they did end up pave, repaving the road. I guess it was time. It was in the budget. But then once you repaved the road, we corrected it. No more potholes, and it's not coming back, or at least not that pothole. Mary, I want to repave you. If you had a choice, would you like for me just to get you out of pain or make you as healthy as I possibly can? Well, as healthy as I possibly can. Okay, great. Well, Doc, if I can afford it. I'm like, I get it. I get it. Taking money out of the equation, which would you choose? Oh, I would like correct. I would like to be corrective care. Okay, great. Because, Mary, the plan that I set up for you in the way of treatment program that I just discussed with you, that is a corrective plan. Okay, great. So can I afford this, Doc? 
All right, well, uh, again, uh, right now, I know you had two questions, how much, how long? So do you understand how long? <laughs> I do. Okay, and do you understand how your body worked here? I want you to take this, and I hold up the form, the Merrick chart, which on the, on the back I, of which I did the brain-body diagram. And I'm like, I want you to bring this home. This is for you. Okay, great. Thanks, Doc. Okay, so at this point, Doc, uh, is when I would go into how much. Now, this is a different webinar that I had already uh, recorded that hopefully you have listened to. But if not, then it's very easy. You simply uh, look it up, and, and we talk about how we go through how to close the patient that you have, um, whether it's an HMO patient, whether it's a cash patient, um, or whether it's an out-of-network patient, which is what we are in our office. And we collect large deductibles. So I suggest you watch that if you haven't. Uh, I want to remind everybody, uh, you know what, first off, I want to ask if there's any questions and while you're preparing. You know, if you can, please go ahead and just type it in, um, and I will look to see if there's any questions uh, or chat, and I'll answer the questions. Uh, but while you're doing that, I want to let you know and remind you about June 2nd. We're coming to Elizabeth, New Jersey, the Hilton, right outside of Newark Airport. Um, for our seminar, the seminar is going is is amazing. I'm so so happy and proud to have combined some of Dr. Singer's old tried and true marketing methods uh, with practical in office systems such as the morning huddle, um, how to diagnosis point to to ensure uh, repayment with less denials, how to do the group huddle. Uh, an MIA list at the front desk, a production list to make sure patients are getting everything prescribed for them, um, patient, uh, I'm sorry, employee hiring and bonus structures. Cool stuff, man. I am so happy and so proud to be delivering for, for, for David. Uh, he's done so much for me. And uh, I'm also very happy that I'm currently in practice. and I have no intention of ever not being in practice. So I can bring the latest and greatest to you and uh, because the game is constantly changing and I want to make sure that you and everybody uh, who is a member and client stays ahead of the curve. Um, so interesting stuff that I'm working on currently, just to tease you, this is not in the current agenda, but will hopefully be in another one soon, is uh, prefer be becoming an in-network preferred provider where they pay 220% of Medicare doing research about how you become a preferred prof provider, um, HMO reimbursement, gym membership coverage, cool stuff uh, that we're currently working on at Soul Focus um, that we will be bringing to you. Other things that we're going to be talking about is training videos. I'm going to be showing you all kinds of training videos. We have been filming round the clock, uh, well, not round the clock, but three days a week, eight hours a day uh, for several months, different videos. Uh, for every position in an integrated medical office, from front desk to marketing to billing collections uh, to case management to Cairo to NP, cool stuff. You're going to love them. I'm going to be showing them in New Jersey as well. Um, we have a new Facebook advertising company that is just killing it with multiple campaigns from knee to low back to decompression to stem cell. We're doing a great job there. We have a new stem cell company where we do all marketing for you, soup to nuts. So in other words, if you want to have a stem cell lecture, we will do the Facebook advertising to get butts and seats for the lecture. And then we will even send someone to you to do the lecture with our PowerPoint and close the, the attendees for you. So in essence, in essence, we put the consultation into your consultation room for you. So that is very cool stuff as well. Billing collection stuff, uh, we have a billing collections company. We do very well there um, for our clients. So just I'm bringing stuff uh, to, to, to help educate you, let you know what I'm doing in my office. It's, uh, it's exciting stuff. So let me go ahead and check to see if there's any questions regarding the patient progress graph, uh, the brain body diagram, or the report of findings, and it doesn't look like it. You know what, so it's okay. Uh, you know, the amount of attendees that we've been having ranges anywhere from 10 to 30. Um, but for the most part, a lot of people are downloading them, they're getting them in their emails, and they're listening to them. 
Um, so if there's any topics that you would like for me to cover, I'm happy to do so. I love doing this stuff. I love helping. So uh, this is Dr. Raj signing out and uh, for the Tuesday learning session. See you next Tuesday.